Hello. Hello, I'm just testing the mic. Testing the mic. I'm getting like a lot of okay oh that's better all right hello hello I'm just trying to get myself situated here Okay, so, good evening. I'm Amber, and this is my live stream, Bones of Amber. Here, we review news and recent events within the archaeological realm. We are a friendly and curious bunch here who enjoy sharing our love of history, science, archaeology, and evolution. So, share the link with your friends, your family, co-workers, and anyone else you may know that may be interested in this sort of thing. Um, you can catch me on Discord. We do videos... Uh, documentaries, movies, on occasion we might do uh, trivia night. Uh, follow me on Twitter, Amber Bones, um, Amber underscore Bones, and um, I try to be active on there. A lot of uh, archaeologists in the field that are really active there, and um, I will share a lot of their work. And then you can also find me at Patreon. The link is below, Twitter link below, Discord link below. Go ahead and um, follow me on those and join the group. I also stream on Twitch in order to uh, show video games, really. It's not going to be any archaeological things. Uh, just having fun playing video games and sucking at it. So come watch me fail. I'm sure it's quite entertaining. I did get a new mic, so I'm quite excited about that. Yes. I need... Hold on. I'm still trying to get myself quite situated because I was working in the field today, so I got home and had to rush off to... Um, get home and get cleaned up and everything we were digging doing some excavations nothing exciting it was very easy to dig through so that was quite nice it's lovely when that happens because sometimes it can be kind of quite a pain in the butt to try and get through a shovel test unit um i was doing test units not full on site excavation so um for you that don't know, you, you there's like three different stages of excavation. There's going to be um, just like doing your su surface survey. You you might do tests if you um, think there might be a site there. It really depends on state regulations and um, where you're at within the state, like the likelihood of something being there, as well as um, any requests you may get from tribes, at least here in the U.S., if you're somewhere else, it's going to be completely different. Every state's slightly different. Um, I So, yeah, it's going to change just slightly. And so you do a shovel test unit, which is just a one meter deep, so that's almost about three feet deep, um, circular hole that is about the size of a shovel blade. So it's probably going to be about that big. And... Uh, you just go straight down, screen it through um, a metal mesh, see if you find anything in there. Then there's going to be actual units where you're doing a um, meter by meter square, perfect square, straight down. Um, there's no like designated depth for those, but um, it, it does also really depend what the soil is. Um, if you start to reach, like, glacial till, 
um, you're you're pretty much good, at least in the like northern U.S. Canada area, because um, anything below that, it's not you're not going to find anything because you know the um, glacier was here and nothing <laughs> was under it. It's just too old, so um, you reach the glacial till and you're good. Then there's full-on ex site excavation, and that takes a lot more time. There's a lot more units, everything. You're just excavating an entire site, which I have done. It takes a lot of work, and it is interesting in CRM to do that because um, you're on a time crunch with CRM, and whereas if you're doing more like a research sort of thing, it's... Um, you can take your time a bit more, but y in CRM, you've, you've got to get the work done because there's people who want to come in and develop this land and they need you to be done because a lot of people, especially um, on the other end, the engineers and the construction crews, they really um, get antsy about it and I, I can understand. And sometimes you come across people who just think that this CRM stuff is a waste of time. So, but it is not. Preserving our history, whether it is directly your ancestral history or that of just the ancestral history of the land is important. Um, I don't just look for Native American things. I look for historic as well. So um, your Western settlers coming in, I look for that. I look for... Um, Spaniard settlers coming in, um, anyone, anything, just looking to find. And then, of course, we look for Native American um, cultural material as well. So it's it's all important. Um, yeah, so today we're going to go through some articles. I haven't pulled them up yet. I haven't looked for them. So I'm going to have to do that now. And um, then I also prepared a little bit on Auroran tugenensis, which is a hominin species back, uh, what was the date? Like three? A little bit after Sahelanthropus chidensis, which I covered a few weeks back, if you guys remember. Um, so if you want, you can always go back and rewatch um, that about Sahelanthropus chidensis. Today it's Auroran tugenensis, and we'll learn all about what that species is. I'm sure it's one you haven't heard of, and um, I mean, everybody's heard of like the Neanderthals. They've heard of Homo erectus, but... Auroran tugenensis is a much older one. It's pretty dang new. I think it was 2001 that it was discovered. So, yeah, it's interesting stuff. And we're always finding more. So, let's go ahead and check out some articles. I'm super excited about my mic. You guys are going to have to tell me how good it is. I tried listening a little bit at the beginning of this. It's kind of hard to do, um, but I'm hoping it helps and it's not as um, messy, I guess. Um, filters, there are no filters. I wonder, hold on. Okay. Close. Ooh, I just put like a noise suppression thing on it, so maybe that'll help. I do have my dishwasher running, so if that's super loud, let me know. Because that's annoying. And I just need... I'm trying. I'm really trying here to make things better. That does sound a lot better. Okay. I'm just listening to myself. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right.
right, let's see, what do we got in anthropology news? Psychedelic drugs may become a key treatment for PTSD and depression. Uh, not interested. 3D scans reveal gigantic Native American cave art in Alabama. Gigantic. Ooh. Let's check out some gigantic cave art. Dramatic events in demographics led to the spread of Uralic languages. Huh. Uh, language isn't really my my thing, how the black rat colonized Europe in the Roman and medieval periods. Study reveals Stonehenge landscape before the world famous monument. Scars on snails offer a 100,000 year record of crab populations. Interesting. Without action on climate, another mass extinction. How is that anthropology? Um, well, not anthropology. Yeah, how is that anthropology? That's that's about marine animals and stuff. That has nothing to do with people. Well, I guess equating climate change to people is where that's coming from. Um, empowerment of the whole family is half term. Don't know what that means. The trailblazing black entrepreneurs who shaped a 19th century California boomtown. <laughs> Remote Ireland's community survived a millennium of environmental change. Before Stonehenge monuments, hunter-gatherers made use of open habitats. The 1983 mil- wow, like I'm not <laughs> interested in any of these. The 1983 military drill that nearly sparked nuclear war with the Soviets. Neanderthals of the North, I guess. Whoop. Come on. There you go. This male spider catapults itself into the air to avoid sexual cannibalism. Oh, jeez. Also, how is that anthropology related? Digging up the history- I think I need to, like, fine-tune my RSS feed here. Digging up the history of the nuclear fallout shelter, identifying Lapita culture in Papua New Guinea, ancient skeletons reveal the history of worm parasites in Britain, Magdalenian art animated by firelight. Discovery sheds light on why the Pacific Islands were colonized. I do believe I covered that last time. Oh, discovery sheds light. Discovery sheds light. Anglo-Saxon kings were mostly veggie, but peasants treated them to huge barbecues. New study argues. What? Okay, getting to the root of calm domestication. Calm? Corn? Is that supposed to say corn? Am I re- <laughs> Oops. Corn domestication, not calm domestication. I was like, what is calm? Anyways, should traditional vaccines be used? Okay, that is not- Archaeology, the history behind Robert Eggers and the Northmen. Life history scholars call for greater collaboration between zoos, the rise and fall of world's fairs. Well, that's, that's not much, is it? No, that is not much at all. I wonder if there is anything decent on Twitter. The Twitter. Oh yeah, there was this, so we'll cover this a little bit. It might be interesting. We'll see, we'll see. Uh Um I don't think there's really going to be any thing. Okay, so it's just going to be like a really slow day. That's okay. It happens, you know? Let's see what we got. 3D scans reveal gigantic Native American cave art in Alabama. Uh, my camera's like... Blocking things for me. And now you're crooked, and now you're good, and blinded from the light behind me. 
Again, I'm sorry. It's just... I do have curtains up. They're just not, like, light-canceling ones, so... It's, um, just how it is in the afternoon. Maybe I'll change the time of, um, day I stream just to kind of accommodate the sun a little bit. Wait for it to go down some. That would make it... I mean, it's this way at 4. It's this way at 5.20 now, so maybe I'll have to do it at 6. We'll take a look how it's looking after. I might just have to buy new curtains. I don't really want to do that. It's just more money, you know? A new analysis identifies four life-size human figures and an 11-foot rattlesnake drawn on the ceiling of an unnamed cavern. So we got it here. This is it. Kind of hard to see. So they drew over it to show what they're, sh they're seeing. How did they... I mean, it looks like there's so much more in here. Why did they pick that out? Those ones from, like, these ones. The exact location of the 19th unnamed cave, somewhere on private land in northern Alabama, is a closely guarded secret. What's inside is too precious to risk destruction. An 80-foot wide east-facing mouth leads to a long tunnel where the ceiling and floor draw closer and closer together. That is huge. You can't quite stand up, but you don't need to crawl, says photographer Stephen Alvarez, founder of the Ancient Art Archive and co-author of a new paper on the cave. The floors are uneven. Big pools of water are scattered everywhere. When you're a long way from the entrance but can still see some daylight, that's where the artwork begins. Hundreds of images are etched into mud across roughly 4,300 square feet of the cave ceiling. Abstract shapes and swirling lines appear alongside rattlesnakes, bears, insects, birds, and human-like figures created by Native American artists under the flickering light of river cane torches sometime between 660 and 949 CE. The artwork continues well into the cave's dark zone, where visitors can only see a hand in front of their face with the assistance of artificial light. Fog sometimes forms in the cave cool, damp air. This wet environment helped the artwork survive for more than a thousand years. If the wet clay dried out all the way, it would almost certainly simply blow away, and even in the very light air currents that occur underground. The 19th unnamed cave is the most extensive of all known cave art sites in the southeastern United States. Simek and his colleagues have been steadily documenting these sites over the past several decades, and in a new study published today in the journal Antiquity, they required they report that the 19th boasts of even more images than are visible to the naked eye. By creating 3D scans of the cave, they revealed a previously unseen giant figures including life-size drawings of humans in enigmatic regalia and an 11-foot-long diamond back rattlesnake. Tens of thousands of Native American rock paintings known as pictographs and carvings, petroglyphs, adorn boulders and canyon walls across North America, but archaeologists have only recently identified artwork in the dark zones of the con continent's caves. They, know, they now know of about a hundred art-filled chambers in the vast limestone cave system of the southeast. The first site was found in 1979 when cavers spotted an image of a bird while exploring a cave, now dubbed Mud Glyph Cave in Tennessee. Later in the mid-1990s, Simek, who was then studying another newly discovered site in Tennessee, put out a message on a cave form wondering if users had noticed any similar artwork during their trips underground. Tips started pouring in. So we got this one here. And it is kind of hard to see, but with nice scans and then them filling it in, you can see what this picture is. Looks kind of like a person as a corn husk. Anthropomorphic or anthropomorph in regalia from 19th unnamed cave. Interesting.
In 1999, Simic published an initial description of the 19th unnamed cave with caver and photographer Alan Kressler. Alvarez visited the site with Kressler and Simic, but had trouble capturing the artwork on camera because the glyphs were drawn on such a low ceiling. I could not make an interesting image of that ceiling, says Alvarez, whose main client has long been National Geographic magazine. There would be no way in God's Green Earth a magazine was a going to publish one of those pictures. By 2017, however, digital technologies had greatly improved. The team returned to the cave to create a 3D model of the site with photogrammetry. photogrammetry a technique in which thousands of high-resolution photos are stitched together. Finally, the researchers could examine the ceiling as if the cave had no floor. Simic intended to use the models to measure the distance between the glyphs, the glyphs and assess their relationship to each other, but in 3D images. New mud glyphs emerged, four human-like figures in intricately patterned clothing, the largest of which measures nearly seven feet in length, and the giant snake, whose pattern suggests it's a diamondback on an animal sacred to indigenous groups of the southeast. So, here's another one, kind of hard to see. You can kind of make it out over here, and then it comes down, and that's what you got. The serpent figure with a round head and a diamond-shaped body. Markings from 19th Unnamed Cave. Oh, nice. Panorama of the entire ceiling model from the 19th Unnamed Cave. So, this is the whole thing. You've got it. There's the snake one. There's that anthropomorph figure right there. Hmm. Oh, got a nice, like, spiral thing going on. Can't tell. Maybe wings. Not sure. Uh, let's see. A coiled serpent figure with head in the center. Uh, B is a wasp. Ooh, I was right. Wings with head to the left and the abdomen to the right. Yep. Wasp with wings. A stylized bird. Okay. Uh, anthropomorphic figure surrounded by swirl lines. So I guess right there. All right. Ah, pointy butt. Drawing of a life-size human figures in 19th unnamed cave. So, kind of waving his hand. I'm not sure why they got the porcupine butt. Interesting. Mm, I don't even know what that is. What is that? Life-size human figure. I'm not sure how that's a human. This I can see, because, like, you got the head. They didn't give him a neck, and he's got a tiny head, but he got a hand, five fingers, feet, you know, a big pointy butt, but I don't see the anthropomorphic figure here. It just looks like squirrels to me. I don't know. Okay, let's go up and look at this video, see what they were doing here. Oh, two-minute video? Dang. Wow. That is so cool. Wow. Just the whole scan of it they're showing. That's awesome. Man, tech is making things so much easier. Um. Okay. They didn't talk about that. Curious if it's um some very common graffiti you see from around the world. So, uh, cool. I don't want to watch two minutes of this, but yeah, that's cool. Showing you the whole 3D scan. Um, don't forget, I do link all of my sources in the Discord channel sources, so if you um, join us there. You can find all my sort my links. If you wanted to follow up on anything that I do cover, you find anything particularly interesting and want to just go into a deeper dive on it, that's definitely plausible. Okay, <laughs> nice. <clears throat>
I had a french fry. But um, it's got like this mute button on it. It's got a volume button so I can turn things down. Uh, let me turn it back up. It makes me happy. And it does sound a lot better and it seems to be able to kind of get rid of the outside noise a lot better. Um, I've gotten, I've had so many issues with my audio and stuff while doing this whole stream. I've been doing it for like a year now. I think I started it a year ago. Dang. And uh, I've got I've had a lot of issues, and then people say, "Oh, it sounds bad because it's like whirling going on." So hopefully, this makes it a bit better. Okay, moving on. Go away. Neanderthals of the North. A multiple. A multidisciplinary research team has investigated whether Neanderthals were well adapted to life in the cold or preferred more Oh, I think I did this last week. Oops. Anglo-Saxon kings were mostly veggie, but peasants treated them to huge barbecues, new study argues. That also doesn't... They were mostly veggie. They themselves were vegetables? I don't know, that's just such a weird way. And of course it's Cambridge, so that's how they speak in England saying it, but it's kind of not really proper English to say it like that. It's very much slang to say that. Anyways, why am I invented? The Science Daily article just snagging people. Okay, very few people in England ate large amounts of meat before the Vikings settled, and there is no evidence that elites ate more meat than other people. A major new bioarchaeological study suggests. So remember, this is a suggestion. This is what they're finding in their research that this does not mean 100% everybody's going to agree with us. Its sister study also argues that peasants occasionally hosted lavish meat feasts for their rulers. The findings overturn major assumptions about early medieval English history. Very few people in England ate large amounts of meat before the Vikings settled, and there is no evidence that elites ate more meat than other people. A major new bioarchaeological study suggests its sister's study also argues that peasants... This, ugh. Um, you are what you eat, isotopic analysis of over 2,000 skeletons, by far the largest of its kind. Hold on. Sorry, I was going to cough and didn't want to like cough on you. Well, into your ear, I should say. Early medieval diets were far more similar across social groups than previously thought. Peasants didn't give kings food as exploitative tax. They hosted feasts suggesting they were granted more respect than previously assumed. Surviving food lists are supplies for special feasts not blueprints for everyday elite diets. Some feasts served up an estimated one kilogram of meat and 4,000 calories in total per person. Woo! That is so much calories. I don't know if you guys track your calories. I've done it before. Sometimes, I've, like, I've never had it work for me. It's, it's too stressful trying to, like, plan it out. Just eat is my motto. Eat Try to make sure I eat healthy and don't overdo it. But I've also, like, counting has led me to underdoing it before, too. So, anyways, that's... I'm not a dietitian. I am not um, giving any advice here. I'm just saying what I do. I'm not a diet person. Anyways... Picture medieval England and royal feasts involving copious amounts of meat immediately spring to mind. Historians have long assumed that royals and nobles ate far more meat than the rest of the population and that free peasants were forced to hand over food to sustain their rulers throughout the year in an exploitative system known as a form or food rent. But a pair of Cambridge co-authored studies published today in the journal Anglo-Saxon England present a very different picture. One would 
one which could transform our understanding of early medieval kingship and society. While completing a PhD at the University of Cambridge, bioarchaeologist Sam Leggett gave a presentation which intrigued his historian Tom Lambert. Now at the University of Edinburgh, Dr. Leggett had analyzed chemical signatures of diets preserved in the bones of 2,023 people um, buried in England from the 5th to 11th centuries. She then cross-referenced um, these isotopic findings with evidence of social status, such as grave goods, body position, and grave orientation. Leggett's research revealed no correlation between social status and high-protein diets. That surprised Tom Lambert because so many medieval texts and historical studies suggest that Anglo-Saxon elites did eat large quantities of meat. The pair started to work together to find out what was really going on. They began by deciphering a food list compiled during the reign of King Ein of Wessex to estimate how much food it records and what its calorie intent content might have been. Um, they estimated that the supplies amounted to 1.24 million calories, over half of which came from animal protein. Okay, The list included 300 bread rolls, so the researchers worked on the basis that one bun was served to each dinner to each diner to calculate overall portions. Each guest would have received 4,000 calories from 500 grams of mutton, 500 grams of beef, another 500 grams of salmon, eel and poultry, plus cheese, honey, and ale. The researchers studied 10 other comparable food lists from southern England and discovered a remarkably similar pattern. A modest amount of bread, a huge amount of meat, a decent but not excessive quantity of ale, and no mention of vegetables, although some probably were served. The scale and proportions of these food lists strongly suggest that they were provisions for occasional grand feasts and not general food supplies sustaining royal households on a whole basis. These were not blueprints for everyday elite diets as historians have assumed. Okay, I've been to plenty of barbecues where friends have cooked ludicrous amounts of meat so we wouldn't be too surprised. The guests probably ate the best bits and then leftovers might have been stewed up for later. Like it says, I found no evidence of people eating anything like this much animal protein on a regular basis. If they were, we would have an isoto we would find isotopic evidence of excess protein and signs of disease like gout from the bones. But we're just not finding that. The isotopic evidence suggests that diets in this period were much more similar across social groups than we've been led to believe. We should imagine a wide range of people living livening up bread with small quantities of meat and cheese or eating pottages of leeks and whole grains with a little meat thrown in. The researchers believe that even royals would have eaten a cereal-based diet and that these occasional feasts would have been a treat for them too. Well, of course, a feast is a treat for everybody. Even how you're going to prepare the food is, is special, you know? Um, peasants feeding kings. These feasts would have been lavish outdoor events at which whole oxen were roasted in huge pits, examples of which have been excavated in East Anglia. Lambert says historians generally assume that medieval feasts were exclusively for elites, but these food lists show that even if you allow for huge appetites, 300 or more people must have attended. That means that a lot of ordinary farmers must have been there, and this is big political implications. So something important politically happened and everybody celebrated. Kings in this period included Raidwald, the early 7th century East Anglian king, perhaps buried at Sutton Ho, are thought to have received renders of food known in Old English as fjorm, or food rent, from the free peasants of their kingdoms. It is often assumed that these were the primary source of food for royal households and that king's own lands played a minor supporting role at best. As kingdoms expanded, it has also been assumed that food rent was redirected by royal grants to sustain a broader elite, making them even more influential over time. 
But Lambert studied the use of the word fjorm in different contexts, including aristocratic wills, and concludes that the term referred to a single feast and not this primitive form of tax. This is significant because food rent required no personal involvement from a king or lord and no show of respect to the peasants who were duty-bound to provide it. When kings and lords attended communal feasts in person, however, the dynamics would have been very different. Um, we're looking at kings traveling to massive barbecues hosted by free peasants, people who owned their own farms and sometimes slaves to work on them. You could compare it to a modern presidential campaign dinner in the U.S. This was a crucial form of political engagement. Uh, I wouldn't compare it because the kings were not elected. What? I mean, it's... How was it a political engagement? He's not going... Okay. This rethinking could have far-reaching implications for medieval studies and English political history more generally. Food renders have informed theories about the beginning of English kingship and land-based patronage politics and are central to ongoing debates about what led to the subjection, subjection of England's once free peasantry. Leggett and Lambert are now eagerly awaiting the publication of isotopic data from the Winchester mortuary chests, which are thought to contain the remains of Egbert, Canute, and other Anglo-Saxon royals. These results should provide unprecedented insights into the period's most elite eating habits. Okay. So they found a list for a feast. They say this isn't how people normally ate because it was a feast. That makes sense. Um, but they didn't go into the isotopic differences of between people, just said, oh, there's no difference. Um, so isotopic uh, data is really, really good for what it can tell you. But um, something within food to think about is the type of foods you're eating. So maybe elites ate the same amount of like um, protein from some type of animal species, but it's not the same type, you know, as what a peasant ate. Maybe um, land animal was preferred over like ocean, which can change things isotopically, or types of animal, maybe large bovines were preferred by the elite or not preferred by the elite and smaller i don't know dogs or something was i don't know there's a lot of different things that can go on in food to sh signify class um, not just whether they ate a lot of meat and that is a big one because meat is very calorically valuable so Anyways, uh, I don't know how much I like this article, so. Okay. Um, I was going to cover this, but I don't feel like doing it, so we're not going to cover it today because I have something else to cover with you. Let me try and pull it up, see if I can get it going. Where did I put it? Okay. All right. So it looks like I'm good to go. So we have a Warren tugenensis. That is the Latin name for this species. It was discovered in 2001. All right. It, it was dated to approximately 6.2 to approximately 5.8 million years ago. Um, putting that on a timeline for you. We've got... Um, Sahelanthropus chidensis, I covered this last time at 6 million. Um, over here we got Australopithecus afarensis. Oh, I put a really bad one on here, didn't I? Why did I put this one on? This one... It's a terrible one for this. Anyways, 
so it just kind of um, gives you a bit. So Homo erectus is right here. Um, Australopithecus, Sahelanthropus. So um, we're we're like right in here for Aurora and Tugenensis, a little bit after Sahelanthropus. And then up here we have Homo erectus, uh, Homo neanderthalensis, and then of course we are even farther along here. Yeah, I don't think I meant to put this this timeline on. This was the wrong timeline. Because this one's talking about different time scales for um, dating methods. All these different dating methods. Because um, carbon dating, the one you probably know about, is not um, ideal for anything past like 50, 45, so, but we have all these other ones to be able to date. Anyways, um, moving on, because apparently I can't get my ship together. In the local language for where this was located in um, Kenya, the local language means original man in the Tugan region. So far, Auroran tugenensis is the only species in the genus Auroran. So the genus is Auroran and the species is tugenensis, just like the um, genus for us is Homo and then the species is Sapiens. Um, then there's Homo neanderthalensis, neanderthalensis being the species, but we are within the same genus. It's just all ways to break it down and slowly um, identify a type of creature <laughs> within the system that we currently have. Okay, so where was Tugenensis found? We are in Eastern Africa in the Tugen Hills in Central Kenya. So we got, oh, there it is. Uh, we got all of Africa over here, opening up Kenya, and then this is it, and it's kind of in the hills, so yeah. Nice. For you people who don't know where Kenya is, the environment and diet of what we think Tugenensis had. Um, when it lived, the environment was open woodland with dense trees, uh, dense forests, um, the large, low rounded molars and small canine teeth, flat molars suggest a diet of fruit and vegetables, but it may have also been an opportunistic meat eater. Paleoanthropologists can infer that this species ate mainly a plant-based diet. This probably included leaves, fruits, um, seeds, roots, nuts, and insects. So probably something similar to um, chimps and bonobos today where they would eat meat when they can but mainly survived on things that were easier to obtain and you didn't have to hunt or fight for. Um, what did they look like? They were about the size of a chimp. They had small teeth, yet thick enamel, so it's um, similar to humans, modern humans. Oh, sorry. Uh, because of its novel combination of ape and human traits, the original researchers gave a new genus and species name to these fossils. Which in the location, uh, why did I, wow. I'm like repeating myself. I was, um, tired when I typed this up. So yeah, they were kind of the size of a chimp, um, kind of small brained and didn't walk upright. The original researchers gave them their own f fossil name because of their um conclusion that it that tugenensis likely spent a decent amount of time bipedally but um there are disputes over this species it is so new and there's only three individuals and each of the specimens are pretty um like they're missing a lot they, they're not complete so it it makes it difficult so, 13 fossils from at least 5 Auroran individuals. Yeah, 5. I said 3, but it's 5. Um, bar 
1002 and bar 1003 femora are the main ones and that's because the femur is um it's your thigh it it's such a, a large indicator of how you walk so um the original researchers say it showed evidence of bipedal walking um had long curved finger bones and ape-like canine and primal premolar teeth the type of specimen bar 1000 is a jaw fragment with three lower molars which is excellent we've got um remains showing how they walked we've got remains showing how, how they may have eaten so here is the um 1002 femur um as you can see it is not complete uh we're we're missing the distal end so down by the knee and we have up by the hip so this goes into the hip socket and moves around so that you can freely fling your legs around and then it's also missing this portion right here is broken off this is called the greater trochanter um, very important important attachment for all kinds of muscles here okay and then some more just um we've got some humerus here so you've got your arm bone and then jaw with a couple teeth um and that looks more like a maxilla, but the way they placed it would be jaw, so. And then um, some little bits and stuff, more teeth. Well, I didn't freaking finish that up, did I? No, I thought I did. Uh, nice. Showing how... Okay, let's see... Okay, what, where is, there we go, this is what I want, oh, I gotta, I see properties, hmm, Oh, no, I don't want that. Okay, so... I'm not going to show the article because it actually has my name attached to it. So I'm just going to read it. So the f I found an article published back in 2013. So nearly a decade after it was founded. And... Uh, it's titled, The Femur of Auroran Tugenensis Exhibits Morphometric Affinities with Both Miocene Apes and Later Hominins. Uh, it's by Sergio Almasija, Almasija, and then Melissa Tallman, David Alba, Marta Pina, Salvador Mo Moya Sola, and William L. Jungers, Jungers, not quite sure. Um, I don't see where's your oh uh, published in nature communications okay so like i said when the people who found this came out and um uh, wrote about it they said that this was the species that led to Homo. This is the species that we came from. They're the early uh, um, practice of us. And um, they completely cut out Australopithecines, which is a whole genus um, with several species in it. And so it was pretty big deal what they were doing. They were trying to recut um, restructure the um, human line basically which you know it happens uh, things new information comes in and you gotta in incorporate it but this article um, says that probably not quite what we thought at first so 
Aurantugonensis is one of the earliest hominins. Its proximal femur uh, was originally described as being very human-like, although later multivariate analysis, um, multivariate analysis is just multiple var um, variate, multiple variate, yeah, looking at it's like, not variations, um, variables, that's the word, multiple variables. So, um, so multivariate analysis, they're looking at multiple variables, looking at the, the different shapes in the bones, um, showed an australopith pattern. However, some of its traits, for example, lat laterally protruding greater trochanter. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I don't want things getting too confusing. I should pull up a femur. Uh, all right, so we got this. Hold on. Where'd my thing go? There we go. There we go. I don't know. I restructure things. Hold on. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Hey, Drewski. Yep, got a new mic. How's it sound? Okay. Hold on, I'm sorry. I'm just really trying to, like, get things structured, formatted for me to... Okay, so we're talking about the laterally protruding greater trochanter. This is the greater trochanter, this huge knobby bit right here, and all kinds of um, muscles attach here. Your um, gluteal muscles that will attach here, um, up and over here. And then this is the lesser trochanter, another major attachment point. And it's saying that it's laterally protruding. So lateral is to the sides of the body. So it's not really kind of up here. It's going to be kind of going this way rather than the diagonal um, direction that it kind of goes in humans. And this is a human uh, femur. Okay. Um, then there's the medially oriented lesser trochanter and presence of a third trochanter. So right here, you have your lesser trochanter. It's much smaller, still a major attachment point, but it's medially. So we have laterally away from the body on the sides and the medially is towards the center line of the body. So it's kind of, instead of facing kind of back, it's even more towards the like center of the body. And so they're saying because of these directions and measurements of these structures on the bone, it, the uh, Tugunensis species likely didn't, um, they, they, they were closer to apes of the Miocene than to uh, Australopithecines and humans. Our results indicate that both hominin and modern great ape femora evolved in different directions from a primitive morphology represented by some fossil apes. So, um, all they're saying there is that, uh, hominins and, so humans and, um, Neanderthals and Australopithecines evolved in a different direction. And yes, our, um, present day modern great apes are, are, closest related to us today, but they still evolved in a completely different way from us. So yeah, having them to compare and to look at is great. Having a li living specimen is really helpful, but they also diverge so early on. It's kind of difficult to use them as, um, uh, as a way to uh, compare it, it. It's it's better to compare it to fossil 
um, apes. That's all they're trying to say. Okay, the case of Avorin is intriguing because its femur was originally described as being more modern, human-like, than that of later Pleistocene astrolopiths. This was interpreted together with dental morphology as ed evidence for a direct phylogenetic link between Avorin and Homo to the exclusion of Australopiths. So, again, like I said, they were coming in and restructuring the family tree. Uh, we had um, the genus Homo coming from the genus Australopithecine, and this one came in and said Australopithecines had nothing to do with homo it auroran went into homo and um we're kind of questioning that there is growing body of evidence that not only humans but also extant great apes are highly derived taxa having undergone millions of years of evolutionary change along divergent paths in the case of chimpanzees this has also been shown recently to be true at the genetic level Thus, it is possible that none of the extant taxa closely resemble the last common ancestor of living apes and humans. So this is just um, saying what I said, that modern great apes, so your chimps, your gorillas, our last common ancestor, they probably look as different to that as we do, because they have evolved as well. It's not like um, we had a chimp and the chimp diverged somehow you know that lineage of chimp diverged and you got us homo sapiens and still the chimps who stayed the same they did not they evolved they are just as highly evolved as we are so thinking of it that way is kind of um difficult when comparing um to assess the morphometric affinities of bar 102 with Miocene apes and fossil hominins, among a large sample of extant anthropoids, we relied on three-dimensional geometric morpho morphometric analysis. So all they did was they scanned the bones and did um, an analysis on their geometry. So um, I had pictures to show you. Anyways, their, their analysis doing a 3D and, um, geometry lesson on it, they um, found that it's more like the apes of the time than it is of modern humans or other extinct hominins such as um, uh, Homo erectus or even Australopithecines. They have, they have all kinds of scans and, and stuff and charts to show this and I wanted to show it but I freaking have it on this and I, I can't, it's, look, my name's on it so I can't, not on the article, my name is not on the article, I had nothing to do with this article, it's just on the page so I can't show you. Uh. But they do have a Warren kind of more at the break. Oh, hold on. I wonder. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Am I that silly? Am I that silly? Let's see. Where'd you go? Do, do, do. Uh, no, can't do it. Okay. Oh, well. That's okay. That's okay. But yeah, they have like data showing where where the measurements and stuff, these 3D renderings fall when compared to uh, many different species, both extant and um, modern and or extant and extinct. And they showed that they're, they're much more, Aurorian is much more like the apes of the time. So a little bit different, kind of leaning more towards the Australopithecines, but not quite there. Um, yeah, so, which makes much more sense for the time period of this species when it was dated. But yeah, um, it's when you get a new discovery, it can kind of get away from you sometimes. Not saying they were wrong or anything, but 
just looking at it with other tools and uh, being able to use computer genera generation things can help a lot. Okay, I'm starting to like, stutter. I'm not really speaking very clearly anymore. So I am going to end that for today. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the stream. I hope you learned a little something. If you have any questions or anything like that, go ahead and um, leave comments. I want comments. I would love for you guys to share the stream with friends, family, coworkers, anybody. Um, I trying to grow the channel, see what we can make from this. Uh, I did buy a new mic. Hopefully it's working a lot better. Drewski says it's great. Thank you, Drewski. Um, that's pretty much all I have for today. And I hope you guys enjoyed this week's show. Catch me on Twitch. I do stream occasionally. There is no schedule for that one. It's just when I feel like playing video games. Come watch me be terrible at them. It, it You might enjoy yourself. I don't know. Sometimes I'm funny. Sometimes it's just sad. But maybe you find that funny too. Maybe you're a weirdo. I don't know. Um, there is a Discord link below. Um, join the channel so that we can talk, um, discuss things, watch documentaries, stuff like that. Maybe trivia night. Um, there's also a link for my Twitter and my Patreon. So yeah, let's let's get this started. Join me. Join me. We can look at bones. Okay, I'm done being creepy. I'm gonna let you guys go. Uh, have a great evening, everybody.